Okay. Hi there, and welcome to another interview. Today, I've got Dr. Angela Stanton, who is an absolute expert in migraines and headaches and stuff like that. Hi there, Dr. Stanton. Hi, how are you doing today? Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm doing well, and uh, I'm glad that your T-shirt max- matches my background. Um, <laughs> As everybody that sees these interviews, I always get straight to the nitty gritty. So I want to ask you, Dr. Stanton, how do you eat in a day? Okay, so it changes by the season. And on some days, even between my first meal and second meal, I only eat two meals a day. And uh, I usually skip my breakfast. So I do what's called the TRE, the time-restricted eating all the time. And um, I typically do carnivore in the wintertime. So seasonally being appropriate to our ancestral being. And then in the springtime and summer and fall, I kind of sort of change to low carb high fat and add um, maybe keto. So depending upon what season it is, but I discovered that many times they do what I call the hyper carnivore, uh, which is sort of kind of an interim. So you just eat really one or two carb grams a day from plants. If even that is not necessary, but if you feel like it, so I can add maybe a pickle to my burger or, you know, a pepper to my uh, uh, creation. And I sometimes will eat some fruit. So I will have some days when I feel like eating some more fruits than I should, but I don't eat sweeteners at all. So not even the naturals or the artificials or any kind. Uh, If I want to eat sugar, I will eat sugar, um, which may happen on birthdays, maybe three times a year, something like that. But normally I am, even when I'm keto or low carb, it's always high meat protein. So I am very much into, and I usually eat a higher protein level than what is recommended. So I'm uh, more of a protein friendly person than uh, a fat friendly, although fat is obviously much higher than the normal, but that is the way I usually eat. And how long have you been eating like that? I would say I started about nine years ago, started with just low carb. And then I went through the traditional route of trying the formal keto, trying the formal carnivore, trying everything to see where where is my personal fit? Because everybody has a little bit of a specialty depending on your lifestyle. And also, of course, the family. And that was important for me to see. Uh, Of course, my children are all grown and out of the house, but I have a husband who is very important to me. And so to convince him, to switch away from the grains. Uh, he was never a sugar fan, so that was easy. I, if he didn't see a, uh, any kind of a candy or sugar for 10 years, he'd be fine. But he was very much a bread person, and and I was too. Not so much cereal, that kind of junk food. We never really ate junk foods, but very heavy on the grains. So I figured if I can't convince him, and I could, and it took a few years, but I got there. So now the whole family. And so we kind of eat very similarly. Um, in that we're eating sort of kind of in between carnivore and keto. And what was the thing that made you look into diet and nutrition? What was the trigger that made you think it was that important? In my case, it was quite different from other people because most people move into it because of weight or ill health. And I didn't have that much of a weight problem. I was maybe 15 pounds over or something. So it was not as significant. And I'm still about five to 10 over. But for my age, I don't mind that. I actually appreciate it. Um, but it was because of my migraines. And I didn't actually know how ill of a person I was at that time. I was on medications. I had a lot of conditions, but you don't really know that you're a sick person until you suddenly aren't sick, right? And so I didn't have the goal of becoming healthy per se, because I thought I was healthy, right? So we don't necessarily know that we aren't. But I have migraines. And so to get rid of my migraines, I tried everything possible, all the medications available, all the tricks. I mean, if somebody told me I had to do a handstand on one hand with my nose touching, a, I don't know, a, a dog poop, I would have done that to get rid of my migraines, right? And so it was really desperation, desperate times. And I tried everything. And it appeared to me, first of all, it wasn't the diet, but add the addition of the salt. But then as I started reading of how salt, for example, leaves the body when you're taking in carbohydrates, glucose entering the cells removes both sodium and water. And I said, whoa, there's a connection here to carbohydrates. So let me see if I can improve. And so kind of sort of coincidentally through scientific understanding of the, the, the physiology of what you eat, 
was the one that basically got me into changing to the low carb and keto and carnivore space. It wasn't my wanting to uh, be fit and slim and that kind of stuff. So it was a completely unusual entry. But once I entered and once I discovered it, and it was through my books and literature that I read that um, I was able to start to connect the dots. And I said, okay, so this clearly has something to do with migraine. And through my evolution of understanding of what caused migraine and my reduction of migraine, is how I somehow ended up with this diet. And then I modified the diet to <clears throat> totally be pre preventive. So that still took a lot of experimentation. And also by then I had my Facebook migraine group, which by now has 14,000 members. And um, I asked my members of how they were and, and we had a lot of discussions and we had a lot of feedback I was receiving of, okay, so this one, made me give me a migraine. This one was not good. This one was fantastic. And so slowly I had a better picture of not just me, but other people of how to apply a low carb diet to migraine, because that's different from the conventional low carb or keto or carnivore. So on my, for a migraineur, uh, there are differences in all of these uh, ways of eating from the standard. Yes. Now, just for people that don't know you, you have a protocol for uh, migraines, which is pretty famous now amongst um, the carnivore community. As I said to you before we started recording, I've had a couple of clients actually mention you. Um, but let's just for everybody get to some basics first, get them out of the way. What's the difference between a headache and a migraine? Okay, it's a very good question, very important one. So a general headache starts with a headache and it can hurt anywhere on your head, including your whole head usually it's throbbing or you feel that it's squeezing, right? A migraine doesn't even need to have a headache. So just to put it straight, there are over 25% of migraineurs don't even have a headache with their migraine, and yet they still have migraine. So a headache is optional, shall we say. Uh, or 75% of the migraines still come with a headache, but the headache type is different from a standard headache. So first of all, a migraine never starts with a headache. It always starts with other things like vomiting, being dizzy, vertigo, maybe a semi-paralysis of half side, like a droopy lift on half side is very often confused with a stroke, but it's often it's just a migraine. Um, of course, vomiting is the most well-known <laughs> migraine symptom. And those things don't come with just a headache. But the headache itself is also different because whereas a regular headache, you can have anywhere on your head. A migraine headache is always on one side. So it's unilateral. It's either left or right. It's never in the middle. It's never on both sides. It's never all sides. It does not uh, pulsate either. So it is a very unique kind of a headache where you feel like somebody hit you with a hammer in the head and it's a slowly increasing headache and it reaches a maximum. And by definition, it needs to be more than four hours. My experience based on the 14,000, total about 20,000 overall, over the number of eight years since my Facebook my, migraine group has been alive, but a lot of people went back to work and left the group. So about 20,000 people. And um, of the 20,000 people, we pretty much could evaluate what kind of a pain it is and how long it lasts. And the average is minimum 72 hours. So minimum three days of nonstop pain. It can be more than that, but by far the majority of the migraine nurse in my migraine group, and they, they are of age uh, two, represented by their parent, two 90s, male, female, it doesn't matter. And the average length of a migraine pain, the headache part is 72 hours. Wow. Um, you mentioned dizziness, vertigo. I thought bowel movements were also affected. I don't know if that's true. They are. Actually, uh, urine is, is affected. And so bowel movement isn't. So let me explain. There's a little bit of a connection, but not the way that you think. So first of all, the urine is, is completely affected because basically the cause, the direct cause of migraine is an electrolyte imbalance. And when there is an electrolyte imbalance, then the person is going to urinate because what the kidneys do is try to bring the electrolyte balance back in. And so it's going to excrete excess water, excess sodium or excess potassium or recycle at the same time one of the other. And so the excess urination, so that's actually a prodrome for migraine. 
uh, prodrome is what happens before ER hit with a migraine. And so when a person runs to the toilet and several times and urinates a lot, and it's very clear white, you know, like transparent watercolor, that is a sign that the migraine is about to hit. Now, the bowel movement part is because migraine is associated with a fight or flight, which then brings up the vomiting and the irritable bowel syndrome that goes with it. And so if there's indigested food in the stomach, it's going to come up via vomiting. But if there is digested food that's already in the intestines, it's going to rush to be emptied fully. And so there are probably evolutionary roads, or, you know, reasons for this, because when you're in a fight or flight mode and have to save your life and you're an animal running away from a lion, if you poop or vomit, maybe the lion is going to be derailed by eating that first before it's going to chase you. So there's a benefit. There are some animals that actually dump their entire stomachs out in a fight or flight. I think the sea uh, cucumber is one of them. So this could very well be explained by that. But um, so migraine start, the prodrome is associated with uh, sometimes unexpected bowel movements and a tremendous um, number frequency of urination and clear watercolor urine. So these are before the migraine hits. During the migraine, it's no longer. In fact, when you start urinating, not you, but the person starts urinating or have a bowel movement again, that's usually the sign that the migraine is getting to be over. That, that's a brilliant and full answer. Thank you for that. Uh, I will be asking questions that many people ask me, you see. Um, sure. Um, and we will get into the chemistry because there's a lot of people out there want to understand the chemistry. But let's get into one other thing. What about um, vision? Because many people say to me they have like a jaggy color thing happening in their vision. Is that is that migraine associated? Right. So there, that's an aura that you have just described, and that would be the official name. And so if somebody has an aura, actually, let me rephrase this. It's very much associated with migraine because from the scientific level, the progression of a migraine. So once you start, right before you start the migraine, there's a change in the brain. And that change is called a cortical spreading depression. And so I don't want to be too geeky uh, on explaining, but I want to explain a little bit about it so you understand. So when the brain discovers that there is an area, there's one neuron, say, out of the 2 billion, that doesn't have enough energy output is not communicating because in the brain, it's all about electricity and it's all about communication with neurotransmitters between the neurons. If in any area, for whatever reason, there's not enough sodium, then there is no chance for that particular neuron to carry a message to create a neurotransmitter and to put it out as a communication to the next neuro neurotransmitter. And as a result, there is going to be a, a message missing and the brain is going to discover this. Now, what part of the brain and how that's uh, not part of the story here, but as the brain discovers that something isn't right, it knows that it's an electrical problem. It's somehow the brain isn't able to activate its ionic channels. It doesn't know wh where it's at or what it's at. In other words, the brain doesn't know itself, but it can tell that something isn't right. And so in one spot, the brain is going to initiate the cortical spreading depression. So what it does is basically sending a giant current through the brain. And this is a depolarization of the brain. <clears throat> so it basically sends a huge amount of sodium through the brain. And this sodium then can activate or does activate every single neuron as it's touching because it's a giant voltage that's going through. And it's one directional, it goes about two and a half millimeter per minute. And so it lasts about a half an hour because that's the time that it takes to cover two, two and a half, well, sometimes it's five millimeter, depending upon which article you read. Per minute, it covers the entire brain and all the little nook and crannies and every single neurotransmitter is going to be touched. And Basically, what the person sees as the jagged lines or the beautiful aura or anything else is the electrical dots, the stimulation itself. So when you look at something like I'm looking at you right now, I don't actually see you. I comprehend that I'm seeing you based on the electrical signals that my um, occipital cortex, which is in the back of the brain, which is connected to the eyes, sees. And so that part of the brain sees little dots, colors in, in this case 
that I'm looking at you, but it doesn't know I'm looking at you. So my brain makes an image that it thinks I'm looking at, which is you. In the case of the cortical spitting depression, that every single neuron is being touched and it sparks a signal. So that is an electrical signal as far as a cortical, you know, in your brain for the, the occipital cortex. If the signal is heading in such a direction that the occipital cortex thinks it's coming from the eyes. So if it's coming in a cross-directional, you won't have an aura. But if it's coming in that direction, you're going to have an aura. And so basically what you're seeing is the activation of your brain. And so that's why a person with an aura can close his or her eyes. And, and it's only one eye, by the way, because only one hemisphere is having the, um, the migraine. And so you can close your eye and you can see it. Now, the question is, is that, is this only for people that this is a specific different kind of migraine? Or is this something that doesn't differentiate one migraine from the other? And so the current evidence-based medicine says migraine aura is different. Uh, migraine, you know, aura migraines are different. They completely different type. They do different things. They have higher uh, chance for stroke, completely different kind of migraine. What I'm saying is that no, all migraines have this cortical spreading depression. But the way I explain that, if it is initiated from a different part of the brain that isn't lined up with the eye, the, the nerve coming from the eyes to the occipital, cortex, then it's not going to appear like I'm looking at the thing. And so it's not going to be converted into an image the same way. But even those of us who don't typically have aura migraines, like I had one once a true aura migraine and other times I don't. And so clearly this isn't that you are an aura migraine or and you're not, it can change. So anybody can have an aura or not have an aura. And even when I don't have an aura, I will have, um, which is called the sensitivity uh, scotoma, so that you will have different kind of visual disturbances. So for example, for me, I absolutely love some of my visual disturbances because they look like fireworks, you know, when it goes up and it, it falls like it looks like it's coming toward you. And mine are usually blue for whatever reason or white sometimes. And they just go up and if you come back, just, just like a fireworks and it's, I just close my eyes and enjoy the show. And of course, take my prevent preventive because I know that this is a migraine about to happen. And in other times you may have, you know how people have floaters? Floaters, every time you, you blank, it's going to go up and then fall down. In the case of a migraine, when you don't have visualization in one spot, there may be a gray area in your vision that is not going to move when you blank. So it's not a floater, but it's a dead area. You're blind in one spot, or it may be many spots. And some people have it like a circle in the middle, they can't see at all. And so that is responsible for the brain region that is not working. So you that is not working and therefore you can't see. It's just really fascinating. Or sometimes like in the middle of the night, I will be awoken with a, a migraine prodrome, like somebody shown a flashlight into my eye, a really sharp, LED into one eye and it's just you jerk up and you realize, well, this was a prodrome, so I need to react and do stuff. So um, these are auras and they do actually represent the migraine that is about to start. So it's in the process. Now, if this cortical spreading depression was able to reallocate the sodium across the brain so that everything recovers, then you will not have the pain. And so this is the famous when the aura migraineurs don't have headache. It's not that they are different, but the aura that they visualized was able to abort the migraine by spreading the sodium across the brain. And for a non-aura migrainer, the same thing can happen, only they may not even realize that they had a migraine danger because they didn't catch it as a prodrome. They didn't see the aura. That's a brilliant answer. And uh, right up my street, because I could talk all day about perception. And I'm, as I was listening to you, I was thinking maybe I should do a special sort of playlist where we go very deep, um, because that's what I did my honours degree in, uh, you know, what is reality and perception, those sort of things. Okay. And I will actually tell you, because a few of my listeners will know this, I actually have that in my eye every so often. And um Sadly, because we live in a world where there's screen work, uh, as I'm doing now, I will get some jaggedy colours and I will get the blind spot. And 
it is fascinating to watch. Actually, it is fascinating. It is, uh, yeah. And I, it's very difficult to explain. And I've seen some images online where people have tried to, to visualize what, uh, you know, put into an image what what they see. For me, it's very like um, pixelation of a face or something, you know, it, it and it and it sort of strobes. But I, anyway, I can't put it into words. But it is fascinating to watch. Um, I'm going to go back very basic again because there are a couple of things that always come up when talk, people talk about migraines, and that's two triggers in particular. Is it true that these are triggers? One is chocolate, and the other is coffee. Okay, they're two different things. So let me talk about which one do you want me to talk about, chocolate or the coffee? Because they're very different. Well, let's do chocolate and then do the coffee. Okay, so chocolate is not a trigger for the reason why people think. First of all, chocolate usually has sugar in it, right? So the trigger is not the chocolate per se, but the sugar. And it really isn't the trigger. The trigger is, of course, that sugar eating creates an electrolyte imbalance. And so that's the actual trigger. Sugar contributes to it. Now, you will still get a migraine if you eat an unsweetened chocolate. And so you would say, well, then it must be the chocolate is a trigger. But no, actually, if you look, look up on the USDA, the nutrient content of the unsweetened chocolate, baking chocolate, and you're going to find it is something like 200 times as much potassium in it as sodium. So there is your electrolyte imbalance, okay? Yes. So for reference for those people who don't know, in our body, we are always pushed to take potassium, but actually in our body, we have an equal amount in by weight of sodium and potassium. Potassium molecules are bigger, and so they take up more space, but technically, physiologically, they're exactly the same amount. And potassium is inside the cells and sodium is inside the blood. So they're in different places. So when you eat uh, potassium, that's fine because it goes through your intestines and the colon and into the cells. But when you drink potassium, as in taking a potassium supplement, it goes into your blood and it can literally kill you with arrhythmia. So um, having to so eating Chocolate, even if it's without sugar, can literally cause a heart arrhythmia if a, if a person eats a lot of it. So it's very dangerous. So this is what's causing the migraine. Now, in the coffee, it's a different mechanism. We all know that we drink coffee because it makes us uh, sort of kind of livelier, right? I don't drink coffee, but for those who do. But why does it happen is because it's a vasoconstrictor. And as a vasoconstrictor, uh, let me give you two important connections here. One is that if you are a migraineur, you take triptans. Triptans are all the first line of um, not cure, but help if you already started the migraine. What do they do? They vasoconstrict. That is what they do. And so if you have a cup of coffee instead of a, a triptan, you may abort your migraine because it's a vasoconstrictor. But it may also make it a lot worse. Because if, for example, you are in going to a high pressure environment, uh, I'm talking about barometric pressure, for example, or you're going into cold, which shrinks or vasoconstricts on its own to have your blood vessels go deeper and reduce the chance of evaporating your, your heat. Um, if you then drink a cup of coffee, which further constricts, it's literally going to squeeze your blood to death. And so it's going to... Uh, make your body thinks that you're overhydrated. And so here, when we're looking at the blood vessels, which are basically muscles, and so they can vasoconstrict or vasodilate depending upon uh, what state they are in and the heat and the pressure and so forth. So if you drink coffee at the bedtime, it can increase your migraine because it can continue the constriction of the blood vessels. And so if you happen to drink coffee in a bad time, then you're gonna get a migraine from it. It's not that it triggered your migraine, but it caused a vasoconstriction at a very bad time. And that triggered your migraine because it just simply, simply created a situation where your blood vessels are just too tight for the amount of blood in your uh, body, which is about five to six liters, depending on the person. If you're drinking at a time, say you go up hiking to a mountain or you fly to a high altitude, where your blood vessels will dilate because the air pressure is just much less around you. So your whole body is actually going to become bigger a little bit. 
because you can breathe bigger, except there's less oxygen, but you can, you're, you're lighter. And then your blood vessels are dilated, so your relative blood volume is going to be much lower. So in this case, if you constrict your blood vessels, then your relative blood vessel uh, blood volume is going to re return to normal. And that then is going to help prevent a migraine. So whether, whether you drink the coffee in the right time or the wrong time makes a very big difference in how your body is going to respond to that coffee and whether it's going to end up giving you a migraine or curing the migraine. And you mentioned in that brilliant answer there, you were talking about aborting the migraine. Right. But there is two things I'd like to talk about. One is um, a better thing, possibly a prevention, and then come on to, right, you've tried the prevention and it hasn't quite worked. You've got a migraine. How can you abort it? Are you okay to, to answer that very big Absolutely. topic? Yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. So to prevent a migraine is a completely different story from aborting one, right? And so the approach is slightly different because the prevention is when you're still well and everything is in balance in your body and you just want to maintain that balance. Whereas the abortion, or that's a bad word because people may think you're talking about aborting a baby, but it's aborting of a migraine. You're basically talking about interrupting a process. And so what is that process is, uh, as I noted previously, it's an electrolyte imbalance. So when you're aborting a migraine, you are basically reestablishing the state of proper electrolytes in the body. And that on its own is going to stop the migraine because the moment you have the proper amount of sodium and potassium in the location where it is used in your brain, in that instant, there's no more migraine because everything is recovered. So uh, you can, for example, somebody may be having a, uh, an aura, for example, and, uh, we'll, and we can talk about how take the proper uh, process to proper steps to uh, abort this, then the aura can in one second just disappear. And so it's not a long process because once it's reset, the electrolyte is reset to be good, it's done no more pain and, and no more aura. It's just gone. Uh, but the prevention is a long-term effort because what I found is that migraines are so carbohydrate sensitive that I actually call them carbohydrate intolerant and glucose sensitive. And although glucose sensitive in its medical definition, uh, result, uh, you know, it, it is capped for diabetes, I'm not using it in that sense. I'm using it in the sense that it does cause diabetes to all migraineurs. I find that 99.99% of the migraineurs who join me have a form of diabetes. It may be prediabetes, insulin resistance, doesn't matter. It's all diabetes at a different level. And that's because they're so carbohydrate intolerant that oftentimes even a small amount of carbohydrates, it doesn't need to be sugar, just even a small amount of carbohydrates. And we found that on Average, most migraineurs get a migraine if they eat more than five carbohydrate grams, which is about two bites of an apple, something like that, uh, when they come into my migraine group. Uh, as they treat themselves, of course, the body becomes normal and healthy, and then they become a little bit better, but there's a period in between when they become even worse. And so they're so carbohydrate intolerant that the, the prevention um, is a long one. Because in addition to reducing all the carbohydrates and taking everything away, they have to heal the body. And oftentimes, migraineurs end up with uh, um, little um, uh, white uh, things on their myelin uh, lesions and uh, when they have an MRI and they all freak out and say, there's no reason to freak out because this is completely normal. And of course, when they change diet, this may even recover and heal. But so there's a lot of body to heal. And so for some people, the uh, prevention itself takes very little time, depending upon how long they've had the migraines and how bad their diet was and how many medications they were taking and what kind. It may be just one week. And I've had it as long as three years. So, and it's for life. Right. Oh, that's, that's pretty clear, I think. Um... Well, what role does stress play in this? Stress, as we know, well, there are many kinds of stresses. So we have to sort of kind of 
define what we mean. So there is a kind of stress, for example, I feel right now because I can barely see you without my glasses. And so now that I clean my glasses, they go back on. And so when your body is under stress, even if you yourself aren't stressed per se and you don't have anxiety or anything like that, but your body is stressed, say you're fighting a bug or you don't even know you're fighting a bug, but your body is fighting a bug. That is an internal stress. And that internal stress can cause uh, internally changes in your body because a stress for the body means your adrenaline is releasing, your cortisol will have to also be released to sort of undo the damage. But when your adrenaline releases, what, what does that mean? That's a fight or flight. And so the fight or flight will initiate a, a huge glucose release, glycogen release, both muscle and liver. And uh, I was reading a, an article just recently, an academic article on this is 20 times as much glucose or glycogen release as under normal circumstances. And so if under normal circumstances, your blood only has four grams of carbohydrate equivalent in, in sugar, which is one teaspoon, and your liver, of course, provides some sugar all the time, some glyco in a form of glycogen to maintain your red blood cells, because that's all basically that needs sugar in your body. When your adrenaline releases and you release 20 times as much as you normally do, well, I can only envision that as a ginormous amount. It's like eating a slice of cake. And it's all coming internally, so you're not actually eating anything, but that much sugar releasing into your blood, and it's releasing into your blood for you to get away from danger, because that's what stress is, basically. And But you're stressed. You may have a toothache and you're stressed, or you may have a cold and you're in bed because you have a fever and you're stressed, you can't run away and you can't even fight. And so in this case, all this glucose that is built up is going to cause an electrolyte imbalance. Now, I've had migraineurs who had such stress release for some other reason, say they get a bad phone call or, or a nasty boss or whatever other reason they have stress or somebody died. And I send them to jog, run, workout, exercise, because that is going to use up all that glucose. And then once they used up, and also because then they're doing the fight or flight, you're acting out the fight part of the fight or flight. And that then will prevent the migraine. And so you can prevent your migraine, even when you have a stress, provided you realize that you're having a stress and provided you're capable. So I had migraineurs who, for example, were in a chair uh, because they had such a stress, they had surgery or something, and they couldn't do anything. I said, well, then just use your arm, fight or flight and scream, yell, whatever it takes to just burn off the stress. And it helps. So you can still do that too. Yeah. And the key there, I think is particularly pertinent is being aware you're under stress, because I think some people think they're not, and they really yeah. are. Yeah, and yeah. a little bit of denial there. Um, it sounds like a perfect segue. You're talking about four, uh, a, a teaspoon of sugar, so that's one sort of white crystal. What about salt? Um, there's a big part of your protocol talk about salt. So right. Let's talk right. about salt. And, and you being in the field, I'm sure that you're familiar with the scares, particularly UK. It's absolutely rigid about. Uh, I had, I think it was a Daily Mail that interviewed me once, and they just couldn't help but put at the end of the interview that before you increase your salt, talk to your healthcare provider. But the next line said, and there's this new medication and they give the medication, you can take that. So in other words, they would rather, everybody thinks this way, they'd rather you take a medication than increase your salt a little bit, which I find really funny. Uh, migraine, because of this electrolyte issue, and because of course the electricity in the brain is created by sodium, salt. Sodium is 40% of salt. There's no alternative, there's no option, there's no alternates. You have to use sodium, you have to use salt. There's nothing that can replace salt in the electricity uh, generation in the brain. But I think that the whole argument is really funny because um, they always say, well, salt increases blood pressure. But I find the exact opposite. Uh, salt actually reduces blood pressure. It may increase the first five minutes, a couple of minutes, because suddenly your blood volume is going to increase when you take salt. But as things balance out, it takes about 12 minutes for the kidneys to run through the blood and clear everything and reset the electrolyte. Then with the extra water that you took in with salt, and of course you need to take the water with it. So it's not like you're eating a lot of uh, olives suddenly full of salt, but you have to actually take water with it. As long as you take water with it, your body is going to reset within 10, 12 minutes 
you're going to be completely back to normal. And in the case of migraine, it's normal, it requires a higher sodium. So there, there was a study in 1951, which I now call uh, basically a landmark study. Of course, nobody else considers it that way, but I do. In that, in that study, they compared migraineurs versus non-migraineurs, and they were looking at the sodium content of the urine. And they discovered that migraineurs excrete about 50% more sodium than non-migraineurs do from eating the same food. So it was not that they ate different foods. And so what this tells you, and if you go into the um, genecard.org, which is a human database and genetic uh, base, and you can look up the genetic variants for migraine, you're gonna see that migraineurs are salt wasters. And so we excrete or salt, we don't recycle sodium like other people do. And so if we don't get extra sodium because we don't recycle it, we simply run out of sodium, whereas other people recycle. So it's a kidney function uh, based on instructions of the brain or based on the kidneys being different. But it is very correct that we simply urinate out the, the sodium continuously. And so we need to refill. And But I also found that it's also better for people who are not migraineurs. So we have a lot of members coming in now in the migraine group who are not migraineurs. And of course they have their spouses and their children and they all go on the migraine way of eating. Then they all add salt into their water because it's also more satisfying because you're not thirsty, right? Because drinking water makes you thirsty, but if you're thirsty and you take salt, your thirst is gonna be gone. And so the water is, water is just there to sort of fit it out. But I find that people with very high blood pressure come into my group. And as long as they properly hydrate and the proper hydration means also a certain amount of water. So the water amount has to increase and it can only be water. It can't be drinks or soup or anything. It has to be water that's readily available for the body to use. So it's not metabolic water, but clear water. And when you take that, I find that people with high blood pressure within 20 minutes from after drinking, so the water, the blood pressure actually drops to normal. And so it works the opposite. So I, rather than being scared of salt, um, we increase salt tremendously. We use a lot of salt. I take um, probably about six times as much salt as the uh, USDA or the RDA for salt in the US. Yes. And I mean, the guidelines, it depends where you go and who who's funding them, to be honest. Um, right. <laughs> I think off the top of my head, the British Medical Journal did a study where it was four and a half thousand milligrams or up to 12,000 milligrams or something like that. It was a, it was a BMJ. It was a BMJ. Yeah, I, that was yeah. in like 2016, I believe. And yeah. there were a couple of other studies afterwards and it's 4,500. But they were saying there were several studies. But so this one that I was reading that said that if you don't have a cardiovascular disease, then your ideal sodium amount a day is 45 to 50, 45 to 6,500 milligrams sodium, not salt, sodium a day. But the benefits of sodium, it was sort of kind of flatline curve. And uh, the tail end where it still benefited people was at 12,000 milligrams sodium a day. Mm. Yes. And if you were a, um, a person with a heart disease and cardiovascular disease, then your ideal was 4,500 milligram. So that's 35 to 4,500 milligram. And this same study showed that if you go below 1,500 milligram a day, then it's actually going to cause you to die. The mortality goes up higher. Yes, I think I, I try. I will try to put that link in the description. And you mentioned that thing there, don't fear salt. And I'm going to finish with another question. What are your views on fat? Because I'm often saying don't fear fat. Right. Don't feel fat at all. Um, I have a very good little slogan when people tell me so, but this fat is going to make me fat. I said, exactly like the avocado is going to make you an avocado. <laughs> it's it's really, you know, people thinking that fat is going to be the same fat that they have on their body is about as good as you eating an apple. You're going to become an apple. It's not realistic because they forget that there's a stomach in between, right? So everything that we eat is going to be broken down into its molecular contents. And so when we look at a fat, let me just take you a little bit into a science nerdy. So what is fat? We think of fat as a sleepy, slimy kind of a thing, right? But actually fat provides hydrogen, 
oxygen <laughs> and carbon. These are the three elements that are absolutely basic and essential for our body. But what does, for example, protein provide? Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, yeah, a little bit of nitrogen. What do carbohydrates provide? Hydrogen, <laughs> oxygen, carbon. There's a similarity here, right? So all of these nutrients that we eat basically provide the exact same chemical elements. And when we eat in our stomach with the acid, everything breaks down into its molecular or atomic nature. Because what do our mitochondria do? They basically split water into hydrogen and oxygen, right? And then we exhale carbon and oxygen, which is a carbon dioxide. And the hydrogen is the one that is giving us the energy, right? That's the ATP part. So everything that we do, the whole body, whatever we do is break water into hydrogen and oxygen. And so whether you eat it as fat, carbohydrate, or protein, the exact same thing happens. So how can we say then that fat is bad for us and carb is good for us and protein is not good when it is red meat and is good when it's white meat? It's silly. They are all just providing the exact same nutrients. And what our body will do with us with these nutrients depends on our health. If you're unhealthy, yeah, fat is not going to be good for you. If you have a metabolic disease and you're eating a lot of cake with a lot of butter on top of it, yep, yeah, you're not going to be healthy and you're going to end up fatter. But if you're not eating the cake, you're just eating the butter stick and that's all you ate that day with a slice of steak, you're going to be perfect. <laughs> And if, if people wanted to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to contact you? Okay, so, well, they can always find me on Twitter. And my handle there is at MigraineBook. That's an easy one to remember. Uh, they can find me on Facebook based on my name as Anders, Angela A. Stanton, PhD. And also there's a couple of my accounts there, with Dr. Angela Stanton, there's Stanton Migraine Protocol. There's a, a, lot, of, a lot of different accounts, uh, pages on Facebook. So they can find me there as well. And of course, they can email me too, which is Angela at migraine-book.com. And you you must get such a, such a lot of job satisfaction. because Oh, I do. But you know, uh, a very long hour. So I am uh, not young, as, as you can tell. I'm almost seven. I'm going to be 70 this year. And I found myself having to go to bed at one o'clock this morning because I said, oh, I'm going to have an interview. <laughs> I need to go to get some sleep. So I work very long hours because... One of the things that I do in the migraine Facebook group is I analyze blood tests for the people who come in. And uh, also we run uh, glucose and uh, ketone tests, which is like a, a five hour long postprandial test. And I'm analyzing all of these for people to help them, guide them to become healthy. And I discover a lot of illnesses some of the people have. And um, then I recommend doctors for this or that and make recommendations. So I'm actually working with about 30 different doctors as well, many of them are in my group. Some of the bigger ones, uh, bigger names from Facebook as well are in my group. Or send them, send me their patients. So you go to well, them. I, I, w- I would say this. Um, I'm not flattering you. Uh, I really mean this. I saw an inter- interview a few years ago that you did, and I think you're aging backwards. I really do. I think. You, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I think you look younger than in that interview, which was a few years ago. So I just want to thank you for your, your time today. That's brilliant. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor, pleasure. How good was that? That was that was fascinating about migraines and also about headaches and electrolytes. If you want to know more of the sort of sciencey, geeky stuff about health, I recommend you check out this video. This one, just just click it. You can subscribe if you want, but this video is really good.